Pink Shirt Day, or Anti-Bullying Day, however one likes to call it, is a day on which students come to school wearing a pink, blue, or purple shirt in an utterly token and vacuous, I, I mean inspiring and brave, attempt to fight against bullying. Now, the exact date of Pink Shirt Day varies depending on which part of the world you happen to reside in. Here in Canada, and in our little buddy America, the day is celebrated on February 28th, but the UN has made the official Anti-Bullying Day being last Friday on May 4th. So, let's take a look at the noble anti-bullying cause. Should be fun, right? My name is Alzael, so lube up, because we're going in deep. Anti-bullying campaigns have been all the rage in the, ed in the education industry since the Columbine shootings in the 90s. It may not sound like a big thing ostensibly, but the system spends many, many millions a year on this shit. Here in Canada alone, you can get yourself up to $500,000 in grant money, to put through your idea for stopping kids from being the little obnoxious shits that they are to each other. Seriously, half a mil. Now, a lot of the anti-bullying programs that we use today are based on the methods of Dan Olwus, a Norwegian researcher, of course it's Norway, who put forth the Olwus Bully Prevention Program. Now, there are other types, but, but they all largely use the same general methods. They work by the program centering around school-wide bullying rules, increased supervision, teacher intervention, and persistent anti-bullying messaging. And I mean, like, really persistent. Some schools nowadays have weekly student assemblies on bullying and interventions and fuck that shit. My point being, bullying is big business now. But back to Pink Shirt Day. Now, the exact day for this varies somewhat depending on where you are, but Pink Shirt Day has been adopted by, by about 30 nations worldwide. 30 very very cucked nations worldwide, that is. This shit started about 10 years ago in Cambridge, Nova Scotia, because, well, quite frankly, most horrific and unholy things tend to start in Nova Scotia. When two students named Travis Price and David Shepard supposedly saw a kid in the ninth grade getting bullied by other children because he was wearing a pink shirt. Now, Travis and his friend could have just walked up to those bullies and told them to stop and not do it anymore or they'd, or they'd kick some ass, or, you know, reported the bullying, but apparently that wasn't passive-aggressive enough. Instead, the two went to a discount store and bought 50 pink shirts, and how the hell did they manage to find a place that actually had 50 pink men's shirts lying around? Then they went home, and, well, I'll let Travis tell the story as he does in this recent interview. Eventually, we came up with the idea that if we wore pink and got other people to wear pink, that they couldn't bully all of us, essentially. So we went out and bought everything we could find that was pink, Try to encourage our school to wear pink the next day, and fortunately for us, our school got behind us. Out of a thousand kids, we got about 850 people wearing some kind of pink, and from there, pink day started. Within the week, we had schools throughout Nova Scotia, and the next week, schools throughout Canada, and within a month, there were schools all over the world that were taking part in the movement that we started, kind of accidentally. Okay, I would like to point out at this time that all of that... They supposedly accomplished in a 24-hour period. Now, there are various sources which tell the legend of the pink shirt, but every source just keeps the numbers of how many students they managed to convince to come in wearing pink shirt pink the next morning really vague. They always hint at it being several hundred at least, but they're generally vague so you don't have to commit to anything. That's why I went right to the source and quoted Travis. Now, leaving aside the fact that the current year of this school only has about 750 kids enrolled, and the population of Cambridge has gone up by about 11% since 2006, and there are no other schools to go to in that whole area. According to what Travis has said, he and, he and his friend managed to get 850 kids out of 1,000 to agree to wear pink shirts to school in one night. Now, admittedly, there could possibly have been some word of mouth going on there too. You know, they tell a friend who then tells a friend kind of thing, but still, they got this spread around the school population, bought 50 shirts for themselves to pass out, and convinced 850 bitchy teenagers to wear pink to stand up against bullying. Oh, I'll believe that when we shit tunnels purple and smells like rainbow shirt. <laughs> Gee, if only we could somehow harness their kumbaya powers for use in the war on terror, ISIS would be fucked the instant they brought out the pink vagina hats. So, I have a question. If 850 students were so easily convinced to stand up against bullying, how the hell did that first kid get bullied in the first place? 
What, no one in the whole school bothered to stick up for the poor little bastard until some soy-fed Nancy boy told him to put on a pink shirt? It stretches credibility just a little is what I'm getting at. Not to mention that it took only a month to spread all over the world and a week to go across country. We Canadians take a fortnight just to decide who gets to go first at a traffic light. Most likely, of course, this is one of those stories that started out really small and is just getting blown up more and more with each telling in the media, which again is why I went to quoting the source for this. But Bozo here certainly isn't helping the whole truth thing any, and it doesn't exactly fill him with confidence about this charity either, but we'll get to that in a moment. So naturally, the student was just wonderfully amazed and tickled, well, insert obvious pun here, the media squeezed so hard they collectively ruined their metaphorical bedsheets, the politicians grandstanded and heaped fake praise, and in, and in the US, even Ellen wanted to have the kids on her show to fawn all over them, and I'll get to Ellen at some point in a future video as well. So, much like Walk a Mile, which I covered a while ago, this small little thing blew up into a really big international monster that is bringing in millions and millions into the activist pocketbooks. Specifically, the feminist and SJW activist pocketbooks, but we'll get to that in a minute. Unlike Walk a Mile, however, there's a lot less obvious skullduggery going on in the financial side of things. Unlike Walk a Mile, Pink Shirt Day, Pink Shirt Day isn't really a brand anyone like pays money to use. It's kind of just a slogan that gets adopted by whatever charity wants to use, to use it to promote anti-bullying. The biggest one here in Canada being CKNW Children's Fund which is directly tied to the Red Cross. CKNW is a major charity organization, and most of their stuff is reasonably legit as far as the things they fund with the money from Pink Days, although some of them are slightly questionable, like their support of Out on Screen, a clearly bullshit group that claims to be dedicated to helping LGBT whatever representation in film and media which I have no idea how it is supposed to be helping to combat bullying at schools, or even do anything useful for kids in general. But to be fair, that sort of thing is the exception rather than the rule as far as the charities that CKNW gives money to, at least as far as I can tell. Oh, and don't worry, Travis is still getting a payday out of this. He gets money from his work as a professional speaker, being hired out to colleges and other schools to talk about anti-bullying and, and other issues. He gets big donation d dinners, m a medal from the government. He even had a run to try and go into politics as an MP in the 2013 election. So don't worry about him, he's doing just fine off this. Now, as I said, with Pink Day there is no actual organization to look at, except for the CKNW which manages the main website and seems to be the main collection hub, at least as far as Canada goes. And some of what I think are dodgy ideas of what constitutes a charity aside, the CKNW has proven to be reasonably reliable as an organization, so I'm not going to roast them over the so I'm not going to roast them over the question of where all the millions for Pink Day celebrations are going. Though it is disconcerting that they are tied so, uh, though it is disconcerting that they are tied so closely to the Red Cross, given the Red Cross's history of mismanaging donations without providing any accountability and just generally screwing things up that they are supposed to be good at doing. I mean hell, the entire US Senate couldn't manage to pry open the Red Cross's books after the whole Haiti thing. But I digress. We'll do the Red Cross later in another video too, trust me. So, what am I going to grill these people on? Well, first, let's take a look at the whole anti-bullying thing. First, some terms. Bullying is a form of aggression where there is a power imbalance. The person doing the bullying has power over the person being victimized. In addition to any physical trauma incurred, bullying can result in serious emotional problems including anxiety, low self-esteem, or depression. Types of bullying. Physical bullying using force or aggression against another person. Verbal bullying using words to verbally attack someone. Social relational bullying trying to hurt someone through excluding them, spreading rumors, or ignoring them. And cyberbullying using electronic media to threaten, embarrass, intimidate, or exclude someone or to damage their reputation. It's always so bad to be excluded with them, isn't it? Anytime the cool kids keep you out of their club, it's a grave injustice upon all humanity. Well, unless you're a man, or white, or cis, or gay pretty soon, they're on their way out too. But otherwise, exclusion is horrible. So, you might now be wondering where the hell did these people come up with this shit? Well, of course it would be those fuckers at the Red Cross. So, let's look at some of their stats. 
Canadian teachers ranked cyberbullying as their issue or highest concern out of six listed options. 89% said bullying and violence are serious problems in our public schools. Now this here cites the National Issues in Education poll, which is supposedly produced each pair of years by the Canadian Teachers Foundation, but I cannot find a copy of it anywhere for any year. And the link that the Red Cross itself provides is not active, so take that how you will. What I did notice that I found interesting was how, this, was how the CTF defined cyberbullying. Cyberbullying is the use of information and communication technologies to bully, embarrass, threaten, or harass another. Well, there's pretty much half the internet. It also includes the use of these technologies to engage in conduct or behavior that is derogatory, defamatory, degrading, illegal, or abusive. And there's the other half of the internet. So basically, anyone who interacts on the internet is subject to a perpetual hate bang by their definition. Yeah, sounds about right. But I think I'm starting to see where all these high numbers of bullying incidents are coming from. Look at these definitions. Just about anything remotely negative that happens because of something one kid says or does to another could be considered bullying. Perhaps that might explain some things, hmm? But hey, it's not like an organization dedicated to fighting a problem, staffed by people who have made it a career and life's work to fight a problem, and who make loads of money fighting a problem, would have any incentive to make said problem seem artificially larger than it is. Right? Victims of harassment report a loss of interest in school activities, more absenteeism, lower quality schoolwork, lower grades, and more skipping, dropping classes, tardiness, and truancy. Young people who, report, who report lower academic achievement levels or negative feelings about the school environment are more likely to be involved in bullying. Okay, these two link to a paper called Making a Difference in Bullying, a report written by a woman from the York University Center for Research on Violence and Conflict Resolution, which is actually a thing, and another woman from Queen's University Psychology Department, and I am not even going to pretend that this report has any sort of academic value to it. 49 pages, and they didn't even attempt to make a citation for their claim or stats. And yeah, I went through and read the whole blasted thing, so you owe me for this. Basically, it's just a long spiel about bullying, and what schools need to do to combat it, and help the poor victims of said bullying. I'll leave it in the low bar, of course, for you to read yourself, but basically everything negative that happens through the actions of another human being can be interpreted as bullying, and we need to stop it. The idea of what schools are supposed to do about it basically comes down to the school implementing both short-term and long-term term plans that essentially involve micromanaging the interactions of all of the students forever. I'm not kidding. Just look at one part of their list of responsibilities for teachers. By the way, notice how the first one on that list, the very first one, is listen and believe. You notice that? Because no student would ever lie about being bullied. No, 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 no. Just as no woman would ever lie about being raped. Even if you make it ridiculously easy to punish their enemies by accusing them of it. It just never happens. No, 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 no. But look at this. Create guidelines, constant check-ins, watch and listen for even the most minor infraction, and intervene. And this list is only what the teacher is responsible for in regards to the bully, by the way. There's another list of responsibilities with regards to the principal and what she has to do. One for the parents. One for the parents. One for what they're supposed to do in regards to the victim. And they all follow the same pattern. Guidelines, constant check-ins, watch the children all the time, monitor their actions and interactions. There's even a list of things where a staff member singles out the peer group that supposedly allowed the bullying to take place, singles them out, and then lectures them on how they should have stepped up and helped. It teaches them caring exercises so that they can better understand the victim's perspective. You know, instead of, you know, schoolwork. You know what I almost did not at any point read in here? what the damn victim is supposed to be doing to help themselves. It's nearly all about what everyone else, especially the ones in authority, are supposed to be doing to protect and support the victim. There is almost nothing about what the victim should be doing to help themselves. It's just adjusting the entire school to wrap this one person in a bubble of happy thoughts and puppies as, as though they are the most precious, delicate flowers. 49 pages of this. Never mind you guys owing me, I'm coming for your kids. You know, it occurs to me that these guidelines are insanely unrealistic for any school to even attempt to follow. Uh, like, let's say you have a school of a thousand kids, 
and even 30 of them get bullied. Just read these 49 pages and look at all the work that has to go into dealing with just one bullied kid, let alone 30 of them or more. You could not possibly actually implement this. And really, most schools, most schools don't be on lip service. They'll say that they're implementing them, and they might even try, but really, these programs are just unrealistic to an almost psychotic degree about what a school and staff can actually do. If I were a cynic, I'd say that, that this was done by design, so that they could continue to shame schools and education for not doing enough to protect kids, thus keeping their power in check and the cash flowing, but we know you would never see that kind of morally extortive behavior from the left, right? Uh, never happens. And you can tell that this was written by feminists as well. The entire language of the report is based around feminist thought patterns and terms like power dynamics and empowerment, just... Ugh. Anyways, we're getting off topic. My point is that this is what the Red Cross is using as a source for some of the claims that they make. Out of the 15 citations that they use in their stats on bullying, they cite this report three times, and at least one of its authors another six times. So between these two, they make almost all of the citations for the Red Cross on bullying, and by extension the CKNW and Pink Shirt Day. And I should make it clear that this is not a scientific study, so I don't necessarily fault the report itself for not having a single citation for anything it says. Although I think it damn well should have, since it's supposed to be used as a reference for teachers and action plan for administrators. But the two women who wrote this are somewhat accomplished psychologists, even if they are rather obviously ideologically driven. But I'll give them a benefit of the doubt since this wasn't meant to be a science-based document. But what I won't give a pass to is the Red Cross for using it as a citation to justify the few parts that they took from it to make claims from. That's just secondhand dishonesty. Oh, as a side note, I find it very interesting that all these anti-bullying programs define bullying as conflict plus, plus power. In fact, even the government uses such as its definition now. Bullying is a subset of aggression. Aggressive actions such as roughhousing or fighting may be part of a bullying interaction, but they constitute bullying only when they take place within a relationship where the children involved perceive that there is a power differential. Rough housing and fighting among school children who have a relationship, but where there is the same perceived strength, is not considered bullying. Bullying actions are targeted at the victim in a purposeful, in a purposeful manner and are intended to reduce the perceived power the victim has over the situation or to intentionally harm the victim. The same behaviors when they are committed as random or reactive responses to situations are not recognized as bullying behaviors. Huh. So in other words, you have normal kid violence, which is just, you know, kids being kids. But when you add in power, then it suddenly becomes this whole special kind of evil. Hey, is that anything like when feminists say that racism or sexism is discrimination plus power? By which they mean that certain groups can and cannot be those things based on the progressive stack of the day? Because I'm betting it's been used like that more than a few times if you look. See, power is a very vague thing. There are many, many different ways in which one can have power over another. Some subtle, some less so. So under this paradigm, how would one recognize bullying when it happens and separate it from just normal kid behavior? Remember all that control stuff I was talking about in regards to the report that the Red Cross linked to? You know, it seems to me that if you combined it with that definition of bullying, you could gain a lot of control over students' lives and interactions. Just a thought. Anyways, we now know that there is a ton of cash coming into the anti-bullying industry, and we know that some of their statistics are, let's just say, kind of dodgy. But the big question, does this sort of anti-bullying program actually work? Well, funny thing about that, I looked at many different anti-bullying programs, including of course Red Cross slash Pink Shirt Day, and you know what I found to my great interest? While they all go into a lot of detail about bullying stats, None of them have any stats listed on any of their sites regarding effectiveness of their program. Absolutely nothing. I mean, there are personal testimonials from certain people and anecdotal evidence from those involved in the program that they are always met with great and enthusiastic responses from all of the students that they talk to, but no actual stats on their effectiveness, which was, at first, something of a surprise even to me. After all, how do they get those donation bucks if they can't show, pro if they can't show progress? You know, if they can't show that their program worked. But then I read this section on the Public Safety Canada site that made me understand why this was. It was under their section for successful activities reported by projects. The anti-bullying projects funded by the NCPC are diverse in approach, activities, and outcomes. 
They range from projects implemented at the national level, designed to produce tools and resources that can be applied across the country to projects that delivered an intervention in one school. Some projects in the dataset involve several schools of community partners, including institutional directors. While most of these projects did not include a formal evaluation component, the following section summarizes what projects indicated were the successful elements of the most common approaches identified in Table 7. Basically what they are saying is that these project successes are not measured in their effect, but in how much of their goals in spreading their message are accomplished. So for instance, if the goal of your anti-bullying campaign is to spread awareness to schools across Canada, that's how the success of your project is measured, not in whether you had any positive or negative effect on said bullying, because there are basically just too many variables for them, or something. And remember, the Canadian government is giving out grants of up to half a million dollars for you to put forth your program, and they have no actual measuring stick I can find to determine if the program's working. So I had to go somewhat afield for my information, and the answer to the question is... No, they don't work. Like, at all. At least if you, you know, ask actual scientists and the kids themselves. One study done in 2013 and published in the Journal of Criminology surveyed 7,000 students from 195 schools across the U.S. Their findings were that schools with anti-bullying prevention methods and programs in place were actually more likely to have bullying problems in comparison with schools that did not have such procedures in place. Now, this study only shows correlation and not causation. It is entirely possible that these schools had anti-bullying programs because they already had larger than usual bullying problems. However, there is a lot of other data to back this conclusion up. Oh, as an interesting side note, the study also did not find any difference that race was a factor in the prevalence of bullying. Anyways. A meta-analysis in the Criminal Justice Review conducted by Christopher Ferguson and others at Texas A&M International University looked at over 42 different published studies made up of 45 different observations. After crunching all the data from the various studies, they came to the conclusion that bully prevention programs that specifically targeted kids in high-risk groups had a small but mostly negligible effect in regards to improving bullying, while all other forms of bully prevention programs had no practical effect and in the cases of some programs, only served to make the bullying worse. Meanwhile, another meta-analysis conducted at the University of Austin found that anti-bullying programs had some measure of effect on children who were of elementary school age, but beyond grade 7 there was again no effect or a negative one. Interestingly, the aforementioned Christopher Ferguson pointed out in a 2013 article that despite what you might be hearing as moral panic scares from the media and anti-bullying groups and the left, bullying, smoking, drugs, assaults, robberies, and other deviant teenage behaviors have been on a steady decrease since the mid-90s or so. In the article, he worries that bullying is receiving too much attention now, to the point that accusations of bullying may be being used as weapons by one student against another, and that overly harsh zero-tolerance policies might push minor infractions with harsh measures and increase the isolation that can lead to bullying in the first place. Nah. You don't say. Next, you'll be telling me something crazy like most accusations of bullying are against boys. Pfft. Now, one team of researchers from McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, conducted focus groups of kids from grades 5 through 8 and asked them why the bullying program weren't having any effect. In these focus groups, the students often reported that the posters and teacher presentations used to educate students about bullying tended not to be helpful in engaging students, especially if students found it boring. As one grade 8 girl pointed out, it's just one person at the front talking and it just gets boring. So like a big white school-wide assembly doesn't really work. Another theme that came up fairly often was that many of the anti-bullying presenters kept saying the same things over and over, leading students to tune out the message over time. One grade 8 girl said that after you read pictures like four times, you really don't want to read them anymore. Also, to what I'm sure is everyone's great shock and amazement, it looks like kids and teenagers hate it when sanctimonious adults tell them what not to do. Telling Telling kids things like, don't be a bully, or don't fight, or bullying is wrong, tend to be brushed off and ignored by kids who don't feel as though the message is in touch with their day-to-day -day lives. This was especially true when the people giving this message were just random speakers that the kids didn't know or had no connection with. Which you would think would be obvious. I mean, if the kids barely listen to their parents or their teachers when they talk, why would they listen to some yahoo in a pink shirt they've never met before trying to tell them how they should behave? Another issue that they got from the students was that since bullying is seen as a problem for younger kids, the older kids generally don't care and just get bored with the, pro with the programs, which of course the younger students who look up to them imitate. 
Many students even reported seeing students bullying other students as an act of rebellion against the authority of the teachers and program printers who were telling them to stop. Now, on the academic side, studies like Christopher Ferguson's suggest several other factors are in play as well. For instance, there's a simple fact that there is no real benefit to bullies not bullying. See, while we have the stereotype of the secretly insecure bully who only picks on others to make themselves feel better, that's really not a true thing. Turns out that violent, abusive dickwads actually think very highly of themselves. Bullies typically fall into one of two categories. There's the cold-blooded bully who sees his actions as a calculating move for social power and positioning. He sees the advantage it gives him and the fact that it makes other people obey him and defer to him and work side angle for his benefit. And the other is the kind that's just a person who has poor impulse control and responds to frustration or bad social situations with aggression. Problem is that anti-bullying campaigns tend to, tend to emphasize equality between the students and kumbaya attitudes, which essentially would destroy all of the, all the social capital and power of the cold-blooded bully type. In order for them to comply with these programs, they would be losing what they are trying to attain. So with no effective incentives for the actual bullies to stop, why would the program work? There is also the very strong possibility that many of the behaviors that are predictive factors in bullying behavior are simply a result of genes. Behavioral genetic studies of antisocial behavior and violence suggest that generic inheritance predicts at least 50% of these behaviors, ranging from bullying and school violence to criminally violent and antisocial acts. Of course, there is an environmental component involved as well, but the genetic component can't be ignored if you want to stop the problem. Not to mention the fact that bullies typically don't think of themselves as bullies, so when accused of bullying, they'll generally just simply deny it and feel persecuted and angry, or at the very least are unlikely to see any real reason to change. A final, a final reason that I find quite likely, which has been put forth by author Sue Eva Porter, who wrote the book Bully Nation, is the ever-broadening definitions of bullying itself. She argues, and I would certainly agree with her on this, that we have extended the definition of bullying to include potentially anything that could possibly make a child feel bad. Then we're expecting kids to learn from their behavior and navigate these complex social rules that we've created for them in a way that is totally beyond their comprehension and abilities. I mean, hell, we can't even get these bullshit feminist SJW rules figured out now as adults. How are 60-year-olds supposed to grasp the subtlety of, so of social power dynamic? Yet, that is what these bullying rules necessarily require. So, finally, what does work then? Well, who knows, but here's one theory. Which brings us to the end and psychologist Israel Kalman. His program for fixing bullies takes the exact opposite approach. According to Kalman, his program has a 90% success rate. So, what is it? Well, first off, Coleman removes the teachers, the parents, even the school from the equation and goes with the bold and radical notion of teaching his students how to stand for themselves and not encourage a victim mentality. Coleman's message boils down to this, be nice to your bully and treat him or her as a friend. Try not to react in anger and work to defuse the conflict. Through role playing, Coleman teaches kids how to remain calm when they're being bullied and what they should say to de-escalate the situation. The idea is to stop feeding the bully's drive to dominate and win. Coleman says, some of the most cool stuff written on the internet is about me. I'm the most bullied bully expert in the world. Coleman notes that the anti-bullying activists are actually some of his most venomous critics. They insult me, they write terrible things about me, and they have no idea that they're engaging in the very same behavior that they're condemning. Wow, why does that sound familiar? Amazon reviews of Coleman's book, Bullies to Buddies is a torrent of comments that range from large, glowing five-star reviews from parents and teachers to one-star condemnations of Kalman as a hack who indulges in victim-blaming. I wonder which ideological camp that is. People love the anti-bully movement, Kalman says. They love what it teaches. You know how comforting it is to be told that your problems are not your fault in any way? Nobody wants to give up that philosophy. In what I promise is the last study I'm going to make you look at today, Clayton Cook conducts a meta-analysis of various studies on the predictors of bullying and bullying behavior. In the course of this, he discovered that those, that those kids who are most likely to be bullied are those who have a severe lack of social problem-solving skills. A typical victim is likely to be aggressive, lack social skills, think negative thoughts, experiences difficulty in solving social problems, and comes from a negative in family, school, and community environment, and be noticeably rejected and isolated by peers. Coleman's point with his program is that most anti-bullying programs, which necessitate the over-involvement of parents and teachers, teaches a student to look outside of themselves for problem solutions. 
meaning that they will never develop the abilities themselves. The kids that we are raising on this will never learn how to deal with interpersonal problems without running home to mommy and crying their eyes out, and this can have terrible, terrible effects on society and the person themselves once they become adults. I rest my case. I'll say hello.